Season 4 left us on a cliffhanger just as Olivia found out about dragons, and this season mainly focuses on that. Hi, I'm Adrian from Ember Nexus, but you'll most likely know me as KLC or King Lover Cactus from Audrey or Razorblades reviews. I didn't notice that was snow when I first watched it. There's just like cocaine coming out from the wall. <laughs> or perhaps even some of my own previous Nine Realms reviews. So yes, I've had a bit of a rename, but that's about all it'll affect you. I have to commemorate Buzzsaw for attempting to kill these kids. Season 5 was certainly a pickup from Season 4, and I'm very much relieved. I did honestly think it was going to be a very fast and heavy downward spiral after that disaster. Although I can't exactly say that my predictions of season 6 are as hopeful, which I'll talk about at the end. Right, let's jump into some more general stuff before we then go episode by episode. I'll be upfront, I didn't take notes this season like I usually do. I wasn't all that interested in watching it after season 4, and it was also really late when I did watch it. Like if you've seen the podcast thing that I did with Audrey and DJ, which you can find on our Patreon by the way, I finished watching this season genuinely 4 hours before we recorded. Not great. Hello everyone, we're here to discuss the newest season of Dragons the Nine Realms. One thing I know for some was that while the other seasons had very clearly defined best and worst episodes, for season 3 the best one was episode 3 and for season 4 the worst one was episode 3. This season didn't have a best episode per se, but in my opinion it 100% had a worst. The best way to describe this season in my opinion was that it was just super mid. It may arguably be the first season I would rewatch. On a technical level I have to admit it was miles ahead of the other seasons. One of the biggest pulls for me this season was the new forest realm, me going so far as to say that I thought this season had the biggest potential yet. So it's a little disappointing to say the least when only 2 out of the 6 episodes actually had them in this new realm. Anyways, guess we should start with episode 1 where we left off from the last season. Episode 1 spotlights Olivia's reaction after finding out about dragons and her loss of trust in Tom, although it is weird to see that she now does care all of a sudden about what he's been up to. And this emphasizes a point myself and others have been talking about for seasons now. Small things earlier in the show add up to be big problems later if not handled correctly. Because they didn't establish proper relationships and develop them fully at the beginning, something that would be very logical, a mother to care about her son, now feels massively out of place because we haven't seen her behave this way before, apart from those few scenes where she was going through his drone footage. This is still one of my favorite clips on my channel, by the way. Rise up, gamer boys. It's time to get your gamer girl bathwater. Lavender scented moisturizing lotion? The major conflict for this episode occurs between the kids and also, like I mentioned, between Tom and Olivia. Because Tom has a fear of missing out, he made the rest of the gang agree that they won't go out exploring until he's not grounded anymore, which is incredibly rich considering he's done almost the exact same thing on them. I get it, he doesn't want to miss out on exploring or anything like that, but perhaps consider some alternatives. Maybe they just don't go past where they've already explored, or maybe they film some of their flights and share it at the end of the day. Because he said they can't go and there's now a shame surrounding his request, they all become incredibly indecisive even when it's evident something is going terribly wrong in the Ice Realm. The system in place or you as a leader have failed when the people operating under that system or position are put in a place where they feel like they can't make the safest decision for themselves or others. Protocol is there for a reason and I'm not suggesting anyone goes against it for the fun of it, but enough trust should be placed within those affected individuals to make an informed decision without fear of punishment, whatever form that may take. In my opinion, this episode should have been a two-parter. Part one would focus on the immediate aftermath of Olivia finding out and then that being more centered around her and Tom. This could also bleed out into how Olivia's behavior changes during work. Oh wait, we haven't been shown any of that to compare to what would be normal. And then also how Tom's personality becomes more suppressed at school, and perhaps Alex could take up a larger personality to fill in that social gap that has appeared. Oh wait, we haven't been shown any of that to compare to what would be normal. See what we're talking about when we say f***ing needs to be done right from the start? Then, part two could be more on them deciding to go into the ice realm to see what it is. Maybe June and D'Angelo stay behind or something, and Alex and Eugene go. Not only does this give the characters a good bud to flower off of for future talk and refinement about what should be done, but it also lets each pair really consider the consequences of what might happen without the rest of them, but I don't want any of that bull where they change their minds and then meet halfway coming back or going in. Alex and Eugene should stay strong and D'Angelo and June realise that the better decision was to go. The rest of the episode was pretty uneventful apart from the fact that the sky torture comes back and uh, we don't actually ever see it again? <laughs> Never heard of Chekhov's gun dreamworks? Why introduce it if you're just going to get rid of it for the rest of the season after just 10 minutes? It doesn't actually play any role. Bustle also re-recruits two of the three brothers dragging them down into the entrance hall of the ice realm. And he had great taste in flannel. <laughs> Hold it right there, Roughnecks. I got a new job opportunity for you, and it's going to require you to relocate. <laughs> 
Episode 2 is all about Olivia finding out about how dangerous dragons are, or she wasn't meant to. And before we go any further, I love this TV remote. This might just be an American thing that I don't understand, but I've never seen one so white and colourful. It's like they're about to pick it up and beat the shit out of me in Wii Bowling. Nice shot! June, get your hands off of him, please. No one was thinking, oh man, hypnosis. Of course. Hypnosis? <laughs> oh my god, don't even get me started on Eugene. They massacred Eugene. That's my son! I really liked him in season 4 and that's because he actually had more than one brain cell. Now of course you know that if I'm bringing that up, you know exactly how many he had this season. I'm honestly really disappointed. But yeah, basic rundown of the plot before we move on. Eugene takes this dragon from the crystal realm that they don't know about and puts it with all the other docile dragons they've gathered to create a sort of safe safari for Olivia to go on. And it turns out it turns them all nuts. Olivia feels like she has to tell the other parents, and then that carries on throughout the season. Which, to jump in here, was something I super appreciated this season. This season did feel much more direct in what it was trying to accomplish by the end, and it didn't lead to some big bad dragon fight. In saying that, I thought it was poorly paced, and about two or three episodes after this were way too focused on this point specifically without any actual development on it. Way too long was spent with Olivia being hesitant to tell the other parents. Either show these decisions differently so it doesn't feel stale, or introduce this worry later on in the season. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this season was super mid and there was only really one bad episode, and it's not this one, but it just felt really boring. I don't feel at all invested in any of these characters because they're not likeable. The Rise have unfortunately failed to captivate myself and quite a considerable number of others to say the least, with characters that feel relatable, have purpose, and a deep personality. So to actually apply all of that into the show, it means that I don't care if Olivia finds out it's dangerous and grounds Tom, because frankly I don't care what happens to either of them, and this is shown wonderfully in episode 6. Episode 3 finally lets us into the forest realm, and this entire episode is a bait and switch, no doubt trying to stir up another reaction after the end of last season, which if you don't know what I'm talking about... Plus, we gotta add to it, build on top of those who came before us. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Tom's still out exploring for his heritage or something, and I really don't care because this has been going on for five seasons now, and I'm getting tired of hearing the same stuff every single time. This episode is all about finding Hiccup's resting place, and ooh, did I just about stop the season when I heard that. And I know the word Hiccup is used to describe him, but that's probably because he had Viking indigestion. You didn't have to cut this passage mentions his resting place. Where there's a resting place, there's gotta be a gravestone. I'll skip the it turns out to just be a chair where he rested, but where do I start? You seriously think Hiccup would rest anywhere else other than in Astrid's lap? <laughs> yeah, wow. I also thought it was made pretty clear, especially in the second movie, that Hiccup was most comfortable while flying free through the air, not on the ground. So why pick a place that is genuinely hundreds if not thousands of feet under the surface than some place high up on a mountain? Plus, why be surrounded by carnivorous plants when you could go literally anywhere else? Not to mention that he island hopped with Toothless and would know about 50,000 better places to be. Next up, I truly don't believe that Hiccup would carve or mark a tree to be his own. He was very much for nature and harming it or imposing himself on it like that doesn't feel like something he'd do, and when he did do it once in the hidden world, he very quickly learned his lesson. And to further the whole symbols thing, I'll put it simply, either Hiccup, DreamWorks, or I am extremely dyslexic. Bit of a weird thing to bring up, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think so. But team, listen, right? I need you to tell me what this reads. Oh wait, that's right, you, you can't because it's using the Viking alphabet, right? I'll just search for it on Google in under three seconds, and then you can tell me what it says. Here you go. What's that? You you still can't? Oh, that's that's weird. DreamWorks, I'm sorry, but I'm going to give you so much for this. How? Like genuinely, how? Translating it as closely as I can manage with your letters that aren't actually letters, I genuinely cannot make out a coherent word. I'll quickly brush through the rest of the episode too so you know what happened. D'Angelo got some home-baked snacks from his grandma and doesn't want to share with the rest of the group, and instead of respecting that, Eugene harasses and attempts to commit theft. Then some monkey things come in and steal crane the biggest BS since we broke the sky ground rule earlier in the episode. You're telling me that one of these idiots out pulled a give or take two ton mass? Yeah, okay. And the book with Stood it? Mm-hmm, 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 totally. Oh yeah, and the carnivorous plants happened. Anyway, next. 
I'll shoot you straight, I rather unsurprisingly found the main plot for episode 4 to be incredibly boring, so I'm instead going to look at the weird underlying subplot between June and Eugene that sort of mixes with the A plot. But really quickly before that, I have four things that have to make an appearance. The absolutely stunning, amazing, mesmerizing, gorgeous, oxidizing Minecraft copper roof on this building. Truly beautiful. These rainbow test tubes that look like that one ad where you separate all the colors, or they need some Subway Surfers gameplay at the bottom. And Buzz saw holding Eugene hostage with a hatchet? I mean, okay. Oh, and how could I leave out the fact that this building is completely empty? Now, if you've seen the show or watched my own or others' reviews on the show, you'll know that they've covered this brother-sister relationship about half a dozen times. So why not do it again? But for once, I thought this one was actually not too bad. Not good or anything special, but hmm. It starts with June giving massive shit because apparently having your parents feed your older teenage brother is babying. Or more accurately, she's like, eat the crust of the sandwich. You still don't eat the crust? June, my smudge of a shadow on the world. Does it really matter? I don't especially like Western pop, so I don't listen to it as much. Guess I'm babying myself. <laughs> Of course, now that they've set this thing up to be like, ooh, look at how baby Jujin is. He then becomes the hatchling of a dragon in the forest realm, super subtle, which I'm not going to get into the logistics of because I value your time and we don't need to waste it on that. So it's basically the world going, you like being baby, don't you? June disdains her brother because he's actually enjoying life and then towards the end of the episode, the mother dragon tries to get Eugene to fly. This is the interesting bit. As a human, you can probably tell this isn't going to go down too hot. Well, Eugene might go down real fast. <laughs> Please consider subscribing if you're enjoying the video. So what did the rest of the kids do? They step in, of course. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That would be logical. Instead, he throws himself off a cliff? And only now does June care. Funny that. Also, can we just talk about how lackluster these shots are? I feel nothing watching this. I actually laughed out loud when I first saw it. The voice acting was better than it usually was, and there was music, but that's about it. <laughs> Yeah, the reactions of everyone was a tad underwhelming. Let's take a look at June and Tom's reactions. And now let's compare that to Astra and Hiccups after Bert captures Toothless. Oh, please, just don't hurt him. What happened to all this energy? Hiccup almost overpowered Astrid on each attempt he took to reach Toothless, and he was heaving to get to his friend while Astrid did everything she could to hold him back. These guys never fail to amaze me with how poorly their replicas are done. Show me some emotion out of these characters physically. I want to see the hope and life train out of them as these 14 year olds watch someone die. So, how does any of this lunatic cluster of a mess have anything to do with what I said at the beginning of this section? Well, June admits her fault and comes to terms with the fact that she is jealous of how their mum shows more affection towards him than her. Eugene amply corrects her that their mum just treats them differently depending on what she thinks each can handle. She expects great things out of June and thus applies a bigger pressure on her to perform well and focus on academic areas, whereas with Eugene, that doesn't apply as much. And from a real life perspective, I can imagine it'd be quite tough to admit to someone else that you know you're being treated differently because that person thinks you can't handle it. And that's actually something he mentions. I thought this was really sweet. June actually looks at her mum with endearment because now she finally understands why she demands so much out of her. And I think that's something pretty special. Sure it's a shame we have to follow that up with the worst episode of the season. The Snowcano episode from the last season, which was- Are you seeing what I'm seeing? In this image, it's throwing dragons to their death. What if it's not? You didn't have to cut me off! Olivia again demonstrates her extremely high IQ by going down into the ice realm by herself without a dragon and without telling anyone else in search of dragon sight to deter Sledkin from going down the sinkhole and finding the ice realm. So let's run through this plan really quick. Sledkin wants to go down the sinkhole in the woods because she thinks the crazed lumberjack was hiding something. So she's going back because she thinks she knows it was dragon sight. Flawless logic by the way, because of course some random lumberjack in the woods is going to know what that is and would want to hide it from you. Anyway, the problem with that is that the sinkhole leads directly into the ice realm which means she'll find dragons. Not good. 
So, in her infinite wisdom, Olivia is like, yes, I'll go down there myself and collect some dragon type from the Ice Realm, which you've totally seen before in the Ice Realm, just trust me guys, and that will mean that she doesn't have to go down the sinkhole and that means she won't discover dragons. Now, apart from the fact that she didn't tell anyone and doesn't have a dragon with her as I mentioned, how exactly is she planning on giving it to her? Because if she just hands over some dragon sight, then Sidekin's gonna want to know where she got it from, and that's not going to be something particularly easy to explain. Or the other option is that she has to put the dragon sight right near the mouth of the sinkhole, like on the ground immediately after it stops going down further. The only problem with that is that it tells Sledkin that she was right, and there is dragon sight, so she should keep exploring the sinkhole. Are you seeing how this isn't going to work? Besides all of that mess and all the bad decisions that were made there, arguably the best part of the episode is when June asks Sledkin questions regarding her book. Moments full of self-centeredness follow, and it's incredible. I was hoping you would answer some questions about your book. My book? Dr. Sledkin, are you coming? Can't you see I'm conversing with a child? Go on. Great. The next problem is how beautifully inconsistent the whole speed sting of Venom is. In Race to the Edge, I think they did a pretty amazing job and it was very logical, super easy to follow. You get stung, you get paralyzed immediately. The most affected spot is the spot in which you were stung. Genius. Here, the paralysis can take up to minutes to actually do anything, like it does with Alex, which is not only totally useless on the speed stinger's part, but also shows great inconsistencies with how long it lasts after it's taken effect. I'll quickly slap in a positive here because we're going to need it to finish out the episode, I'll be real. I like the different designs and patterns these variants of speed stingers have. The colored dots are something I think actually look really cool and add some nice variety within the pack. I'm not sure how practical it is, but... For pack animals, they sure don't like to attack in packs. How convenient. And also, for how fast their reaction speeds have been up until now, they sure take their sweet time moving their stinger away from other pack members. How convenient. Or just straight up aiming for their members. How convenient. Or just not aiming at all. How convenient. Are we seeing how convenient this entire show is? Eugene's comments throughout this entire thing are awesome though. Seriously? His own teammates stung him? Wonder how that feels. What am I missing? I can't see! What? Happening. And then when this speed stinger does go down the cave that the sinkhole leads into, it sure is convenient how Sledkin doesn't get stung here. And wow, I did not know we were making a horror show here, guys. This is actually pretty cool. Can I have this show, please? And saying that, why did it bite her and not sting her? And then the venom wears off at the same time for everyone. Yay! Literally everyone. But hey, at least Olivia's finally made up her mind about telling the other parents, so into the next episode we go. Episode 6, Deep Freeze, is spectacular from the get-go, putting Icarus in a full-blown blizzard with no explanation or foresight, truly top-notch storytelling. I'm all good with being put right into the action, and there's actually a name for that in storytelling, in media res, which comes from the Latin phrase, in the middle of things. What I do have a problem with more specifically is the fact that it was never alluded to. It would be as simple as just having the characters mention that it's getting colder recently, or showing that they need to put on coats when they come back to the surface from the realms. Super easy stuff. Sledkin, having recovered from her paralysis, knows that there is some kind of dangerous creature lurking around Icarus. With doom imminent for dragons, Olivia decides that she should tell everyone from her perspective rather than have it come from Sledkin. And what I love is that when she takes her phone out to call Tom, not only does it look like she's receiving a call to accept or decline, but also that the language on her phone does not exist. I thought it was most similar to Korean or Japanese, but I've confirmed with native speaking friends that it is neither. So congratulations again DreamWorks, your language skills are two for two. Four failures. Either way, the entire facility is freezing up and Linda is sent out to go collect supplies. I love that this facility has a missile warning system, but not warm clothing. So she goes out to do that, crashes the van, and would get charged with careless driving. And then the van she's driving is not roadworthy as the seatbelt completely fails its job. Anyway, she's stranded. Back at Icarus, Olivia and Philip are trying to restore power to the facility because the electrical generator has frozen. So the kids decide to help out with the assistance from their dragons. They start destroying $3 million property to get the adults away from the generator. Great corp has insurance, right? We are gonna get in so much trouble. Who will they blame? Dragons? Dragons don't exist, right? Uh, my mom knows they exist. Tom is gonna get in so much trouble. <laughs> We go back to Eugene D'Angelo and I really like the music. It's impressive and feels really substantial. Take us down.
but of course we have to ruin that. Now, the way they're tracking Linda is through Plowhorn's scent tracking abilities, which doesn't make all that much sense considering just earlier they mentioned that there was only one road that she could take out, so why not just follow the road? Anyway, Plowhorn loses the scent because it's too cold, and this brings up a really interesting point. Plowhorn can still track things through smell in the ice realm, which means that on the surface here it's colder than in the ice realm. I think it'd be fair to say that the ice realm is probably somewhat around a Canadian winter, so let's say it's minus 10 degrees C or 14 Fahrenheit. Apart from all the other things that are now completely thrown off by that, like how they haven't died from hypothermia or frostbite, it has to be colder than that at Icarus. Sledkin follows the other kids to the generator where they're using thunder to boot it back up, and it works and then she uses a tranquilizer dart on him and then he fries it. Linda meanwhile thinks she's being abducted by aliens. Time for my favourite part of the episode, and I've been waiting this entire video to share this part. As a last resort, Philip and Olivia decide the best course of action is to get in a helicopter and get help themselves. May expresses concern about the wind being too strong for a safe takeoff, so let's put this in perspective. Those winds were too harsh up there for takeoff! I have looked through a variety of manuals, FAA guidance sheets and other forums. Basically, it's agreed upon that anything over 45, 50 miles per hour or 75 kilometers per hour is very unsafe to attempt any kind of takeoff in a helicopter. Thanks to the NORA Association, we can look at this nice little chart here and see the expected impacts of that sort of wind speeds. Structural damage, walking is no longer possible, entire trees swaying in the wind, and remember, this is the minimum. If we just go one step up, small trees are being torn out of the ground and more damage to buildings. So they take off and it's actually all good, but I can guarantee you won't be able to guess why stuff starts going wrong. The wind, right? Obviously. Hell no, it's the rotors freezing, and now of all times too, of course. And then for some reason the helicopter loses its balance, which is funny because torque is actually counteracted by the tail rotor back here, and not the main ones up here. And this tells me that neither Philip nor Olivia can actually fly a helicopter. And if the rotors were supposedly freezing, they should be slowing down, and then the helicopter starts moving down, and not zooming left and right across the screen. Anyway, we're finally here at my favourite favourite part, Olivia falling out of the the helicopter. I won't go into how she managed to get out of her lap and shoulder harness which has four or five connection points and then also burst the door open, although I think it would be funny if she fell off, so let's see if that happens. But look at how stunning this shot is. She's so close to getting chopped in half by the rotor. I also love it because I know this scene will have zero consequences. Of course the helicopter has also miraculously managed to rise about 200 feet again. See that, that's what the helicopter should have done, but yeah no consequences for Philip either. <laughs> And again. So yep, now they all know about dragons. Not a bad ending shot either. Oh wait, they don't end it there, do they? <sighs> Instead they have to end it with some guy's pants being on fire and Tom saying this really awkward line. Uh, this is gonna take some work. Right, so season 6 predictions, am I right? Sledkin and Buzzsaw are working together, that's a given to me. I have no idea how they're going to try and develop the storyline of Tom finding out more to do with Hiccup, and to be frank, I'd rather they don't. And now that the adults know about dragons, I don't really know how much more they can really do. Sure, they still have to deal with Buzzsaw and probably Sledkin and Linda, but realistically, you could just feed all three of them to the dragons and be done with it. Let's not forget we still have to cover two more realms, having already seen the Crystal, Dark, Fire, Ice, Bioluminescent Kings, and now the Nature Realm. The Nature Realm. Not Forest Realm. You know, because all the other realms lack so many natural features. Let's just call it the Nature Realm, guys. The nature realm, not the forest. Yeah, why, why would, why would we call it the forest realm when there's a forest in the realm? This one it has so many more natural features than the other natural places that we've explored. I am losing it. I am. I'm losing it, yeah. They still have to address the sky torture we saw super briefly in episode 1 flying into the forest realm as well. I don't really know, that's about all I can give and I'm not particularly hopeful. So overall, what I think? I'd say if you have access to the show, however that may be, this season might honestly be worth a check out just to get some extra detail on the stuff I didn't cover in full. It's definitely one of the most bearable seasons and I don't see anything wrong with taking a deeper look for yourself, whether that be for the animation, for the extra details that I haven't covered like I mentioned, or 
just because you're interested in season 5 especially for some reason. Just be sure to take notes of all the stuff that's really weird and send it to me. I really hope you enjoyed this video, it was super interesting to write about because there was so much mid stuff to cover, it was tough to choose what was important enough to actually talk about. But if you did, please consider leaving a like and subscribing, or even checking out my Patreon. I've been Adrian from Ember Nexus, and I hope to catch you in the next video where I talk about a genuinely amazing show, Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Thanks so much for watching.